Hello and welcome to the Glen Arbor Community Church Channel. We are a group of people who are eagerly pursuing the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ from our corner of West Chicago, Illinois to the ends of the earth. This week, Pastor Mike Eichen continues our Armor of God series from the book of Ephesians as he discusses standing firm in the truth of the Lord with the breastplate of righteousness in place. The, uh, as we're getting up the slides, one of the early... Um, pioneers of uh, contemporary Christian music was a man by the name of uh, Keith Green. And at the time, in the early 70s, um, you know, 60s, going into the early 70s, the Jesus Revolution, well, there was a lot of people, though, during that time, even that weren't followers of Christ, but they were caught up in thinking that it was cool to have a um, guru, someone that they were following, you know, some sort of guru. And uh, Keith decided to make Jesus his guru. Now, he wasn't even a believer yet, but he decided to make Jesus his guru. And uh, so he uh, started reading his Bible, wearing a cross. At the time, he was dating a girl named uh, Melody. And um, as he read the Bible, you know, he's like, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus, even though he wasn't saved yet. (laughs) Uh, As he read the Bible, he realized, well, Jesus was morally pure, And he told his girlfriend that since he's now following Jesus, that they needed to abstain, avoid sexual temptation. She wasn't too happy about that. But uh, she was in love with Keith and and went along with it. Long story short, they both went to a uh, Bible study, heard the gospel. They both came to faith at the same time, got married, and had an extremely powerful Christian music ministry for scores of young people across the whole country and continuing his music continuing today and uh, that went on for many years until um, he died in a plane crash um, at a too young of an age but I think part of the reason that Keith's ministry had such a powerful effect and let me back up a second I'm sure it was God's timing so I'm not going to uh, counter God's timing on that but Uh, What a powerful man. I think part of the reason that he had such a powerful effect in his ministry is because he strived to live his life with Christian integrity. He strived to walk in righteousness in what he was doing and how he was living. And throughout the decades since, the contemporary Christian scene has been littered with artists that have fallen away and even Christian leaders and pastors for that part who fall away from the faith due to compromising their integrity in their walk with Christ. And typically it's morally, moral failures that have shipwrecked their faith in some way, shape, or form. But Keith Green remains as an example of what God can do through a man who strived to follow Jesus fully in all areas of his life, including his morality. So today we continue the section on Ephesians Six about putting on the armor of God, and specifically today we're going to be talking about the breastplate of righteousness. And what we'll discover is how critical the breastplate of righteousness is to us standing firm in our faith. Now, Chris covered the first four and a half verses of this section last week, and I get to cover four words. No, actually, I think it's like six or seven words, but uh, he had four and a half verses, I get a half a verse. And, uh, but my context for my half a verse is the whole section. And so we're going to reread this again. And uh, I'm going to cover a couple aspects of the whole section that Chris didn't dive into uh, to complement what he taught. And uh, especially how it relates, that's, which relates to the breastplate of righteousness. So let's read the whole section through my half a verse today. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place. So what is the goal of putting on the armor of God? What is the goal? Is it just to look cool, you know, like a soldier looks cool, all dressed in armor? Does it look 
to look good in front of our Christian brothers and sisters? Is that the purpose of it? No, the goal we see here four times, Paul states the goal. The goal is to take your stand. That's the goal, to take your stand. To stand your ground. To stand and to stand firm. The Greek word that's translated stand here means to hold on to your position. Well, what position are we trying to hold on to? We're not guarding a castle in a sense. Well, the position that we're holding on to is our walk with Christ as a believer, our walking in tune with the Lord, walking according to His will. When we came to faith in Christ, we became a new creature in Him, and we're adopted as His children. We were knit into the body of Christ. And just like some of the reading from today talked about what, that, what the Lord wants and what the devil is against, and we became one with Christ and with all other believers in his body. And we are, walk, we are to walk accordingly. So we're to stand firm in this. The goal of the armor of God, to stand firm. We're to stand firm. And what are we to stand firm against? We're to stand firm against the devil's schemes. That's what we're standing firm against. We're standing firm against the authority, the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This is not against people. We're not standing firm against people. We're standing firm. This is far more serious. We're standing firm against spiritual forces of evil. And the devil is the enemy of everything Paul has been teaching this young church throughout the whole book of Ephesians, even what the part section that was read today during the reading. The devil is against you. The devil is against you. The devil is against your understanding of your position in Christ. Um, and as Chris shared last week, you know, our, our position in Christ is strong because he's power, because Christ is powerful. Yet the devil's going to attack your understanding of your position in Christ. He's Going to under, he's going to attack the unity of all believers that Paul has been talking about in the book of Ephesians. He is going to stand against new believers' households, walking in according to God's plan, the way we just read at the beginning of Ephesians chapter 6. Now the devil and his agents know that they've lost. Uh, they know they're a defeated enemy by, because of the mighty power of the risen Christ, yet they also know that God has allowed them a certain, uh, have, has allowed them to exercise a certain limited authority here on earth. The devil and his minions are allowed by God to exercise a certain limited authority here on earth during this time, this temporary time span. And we happen to be living in that temporary time span now. And uh, so during this time now, the devil is operating and opposing the purposes of God in this world and in your life right now. Today, right at this moment, Keith Green, during his uh, ministry years, uh, wrote a song about the schemes of the devil called No One Believes in Me Anymore. You know, we don't really talk about this much. Even in the church, we don't talk about this that much. And uh, this song that Keith Green wrote is from the devil's perspective. And I'll just read one of the stanzas here for you today. The first verse reads, this is from the devil speaking. Oh, my job keeps getting easier as time keeps slipping away. I can imitate the brightest light and make the night look just like day. I put some truth in every lie to tickle itching ears. You know, I'm drawing people just like flies because they like what they hear. I'm gaining power by the hour. They're falling by the score. You know, it's getting very simple now because no one believes in me anymore. Awesome song. People in the world, many do not believe in the devil and pay the price. Probably even some Christians struggle with understanding that. And we believers are called to stand firm against the devil. The schemes of the devil, we're called to stand firm against. That's the context of the armor of God. Peter wrote this. He wrote, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Standing firm in the faith. This is the same Greek word that's being used in Ephesians chapter 6 right here. Resist him standing firm in the faith. God's power doesn't preclude pearl in the Christian life for us here on earth. Peter is basically saying, wake up church. 
Be alert. Wake up and be alert. The devil exists. He's alive and well and is in opposition of all that is God's will. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. See, the devil knows that he can't uh, touch your position in Christ. He knows that he can't touch your position, but he can mess with your walk. He can mess with your walk of faith. I was thinking about this. Scripturally, you see that the devil was active against you from the day you were born. Scripture says that he blinds the minds of the unbelievers. The day, since the day you were born, the devil has been actively opposing you to try to prevent you from coming to faith in Christ. And since the day you've been born again in Christ, he is active in trying to prevent your effectiveness in your walk, trying to prevent you from walking fully in your faith in, in Christ. So wake up, Christian. The devil is constantly taking pot shots at you, trying to knock you off God's path, constantly. We, uh, in our household, we always try to watch a, mo- a war movie around Memorial Day, or on Memorial Day this year, actually, it was the week later that we watched a couple. And um, the one that we watched was a more recent version of uh, Midway. I think it was the 2019 version of the movie Midway, about the Battle of Midway during World War II. And I had never really studied it that much, but I was amazed at the dive bombers. Uh, those dive bombers, those are some gutsy guys, man, <laughs> gutsy men. See, inexperienced um, pilots, I think, from my understanding from the movie, is that when the battle first started, it was just some more inexperienced land-based pilots that uh, went after the Japanese fleet. And, um, but they kind of just flew in kind of like this, kind of level with the sea, low, you know, attacking. They were, uh, the Japanese admiral in the movie called them gliders, you know, and said, oh, these gliders, these inexperienced pilots, they're easy to shoot down. They're like sitting ducks, and they would shoot a bunch of them down. No problem. You know, they were like, the admiral was like, we're, we're safe. <laughs> these guys don't know what they're doing, and these pilots don't know what they're, what they're, what they're doing. But what the, ad, the Japanese admiral didn't know is that our most experienced dive bombers were on their way, <laughs> you know. And when the dive bombers came, you know, they know from um, the, the way to take the enemy out is to go high and then dive down straight at the enemy's ship, straight down. And um, because then they have a lower profile, there's still, you can see in this drawing, there's still bullets coming at them, but uh, there's a lower profile, and they're aiming at the bullets. And so they dive straight down and down and down and down and missed enemy fire all around them until they get low enough where they can level out and drop their bombs successfully onto the deck of the ships. But they have to get low enough to, for their bombs to have good aim. They didn't have, you know, satellite laser-guided bombs back then. <laughs> and these brave men would dive straight down into, these en- into the enemy aircraft carriers. And uh, they stood firm. You know, those that stood firm amidst all this enemy fire and getting pot shots, getting bullets in their, in their plane along the way. They were the ones that successfully sank the enemy ship's and won the battle of Midway. Here's a photo, an actual photo of one of them come after a, a dive bombing raid. I mean, you can see, you can see holes in the tail and in the wings. There was bullet holes all over. They took shots, they took bullets, and uh, they won. The men stood firm. Don't be like a glider pilot in your spiritual life unaware of the danger that you're in, that you're an easy target. Be like the dive bombers, you know, in the midst of any enemy fire, standing firm, standing firm on the track that you're on. Stand firm. You'll get hit along the way. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that the Christian walk will be easy. You know, welcome to the victorious Christian life. (laughs) You know, the victorious Christian life, you're going to take damage. You're going to take, there'll be suffering. There's going to be hardships. That's what you see in the Bible. The Christian life is no uh, walk in the park. But in the end, there's also victory in Christ. Amen? Because Christ is victorious. There's victory in Christ. So stand firm. Stand firm. So the armor of God, uh, which we're to put on, is to help us stand firm uh, because we need to be protected from the enemy in order to stand firm. And this protection is called the armor of God. 
Um, Chris covered the uh, belt of truth last week, and the second piece of armor we look at in this section is the breastplate, breastplate of righteousness. So what is a breastplate? You probably all know this, but a breastplate for a Roman soldier, uh, the breastplate protects the middle of the body, right? And front and back. So it goes, it's armor on the front and back of, of the, the soldier's torso. And um, what is a breastplate of righteousness? It's the, well, it's the righteousness of God. Right, the righteousness of God is what they're talking about here, what Paul's talking about. The righteousness of God is what? It's, it's what is right in God's eyes. God's righteousness is what is right in God's eyes, simply put. It's his character of, of rightness, of straightness, of being right and just. And it's just part of his nature. It's who God is. He's righteous. That's part of who he is. And we're to put on his righteousness. And it's no surprise that this uh, metaphor of the breastplate of righteousness is applied, is first used before it's used here in Ephesians to describe God himself. Our armor is like what God himself wears. In Isaiah 79, it says the, it's about the Lord in his stand against sin in the particular context of this passage, it says the Lord, talking about the Lord, he put on righteousness as his breastplate. God put on righteousness as his breastplate. It's part of who he is. And uh, just as God wears a breastplate of righteousness, we are to put on his righteousness as well. And the interesting thing about this is that in Christ, God has already gifted you his righteousness. About this, Paul said in uh, 2 Corinthians about Christ, God made him Christ who had no sin to do what? To be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You have become the righteousness of God through the work of Christ on the cross. This is not your own work. This is not your own, you know, self-righteousness that you've earned This is the righteousness of God. It's Christ's work, and it's your standing or position before God. Uh, I thought it was interesting. I think I remember this from the Chosen TV series. Um, I thought it was a very powerful scene. This is from Luke 4. There was was an account in Luke 4 of Jesus reading a scroll from Isaiah, Isaiah 61. And he he only read the first few verses of of Isaiah 61, at least that we know about from uh, Luke 4. But after he read it, he told the people, uh, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He's talking about himself. And of course, you know, the Israelites were just up in arms that he would dare say that he's the fulfillment of Isaiah 61. But check out, as I read Isaiah 61 and looked this up, check out what it says later in the scroll in Isaiah 61. It says, he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. A robe of righteousness. Isn't that a beautiful uh, visual image or, or picture to describe how God has made you righteousness? If you're a believer in Christ, he has put a robe of righteousness on you. You have God's. It's not your righteousness. It's God's righteousness, like a robe of righteousness He's put on you. And if you're listening today on the stream and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, will you just pause this video if you're watching the video later and bow in prayer and uh, tell Jesus you're a sinner, that you believe Jesus died on the cross for your sin and rose again, and then invite him to put his robe of righteousness, of his righteousness on you. Amen? Now, there's more to the story here. Because putting on the armor of God isn't just being saved. There's more to this. Otherwise, uh, to be protected in this life from the onslaught of the enemy, we need to also be walking in these things, you know. That's why Paul is telling the church, those that are already saved, he's telling those that are already saved to put on the armor of God, to put on the breastplate of righteousness. You know, we have God's truth. Now put it on and walk in God's truth. We have already have God's righteousness. Now put it on and walk in God's righteousness is what this section is saying. Paul uh, is not saying that we walk in our own righteousness, but to walk in Christ's righteousness because that's who we already are. 
and this protects us from the enemy. For a Roman soldier, the, uh, back to this photo, the breastplate protects what? It protects uh, their, you know, their vital organs, the, the, the key tender parts of, the, of their being, of what keeps them alive. You know? uh, in medieval times, it was, says that the, it was said that the breastplate protects your heart. Protects your heart. I'm not sure. They were probably talking even metaphorically, but uh, it protects your heart physically. The tender, vital areas of the body. Well, this spring, we've been under attack in this country uh, by a swarm of cicadas, <laughs> right? And uh, last fall, without realizing what we were doing in our yard, I, we planted five young trees in our yard. And um, in the spring, we realized as we researched this that we planted the exact varieties of trees that cicadas love, <laughs> Okay. And uh, so we, as we we're reading about arborists, arborists say these young tender trees are very vulnerable because the cicadas look for those tender new branches and they put slits in them and lay their eggs and then it eventually kills the branch so mature trees can handle it. But these young trees, uh, you know, do severe damage to these young trees, may not survive. And so per their recommendation, we put netting around all of our young trees um, to, pr to try to protect them. And um, when, when the cicadas came, here's a photo of some of the cicadas just trying to get in. <laughs> They're trying to break through. They want those young, tender branches, you know. And uh, during the peak of the cicada invasion, as I call it, um, we felt like our yard was the epicenter. I don't know if any, everyone else thought that. But, I mean, it was so loud out there, you almost had to put on ear, earmuffs. There's just cicadas flying all over there, gliders coming in, you know, and our dog would run up, and jump up and eat them, you know, right out of the air. <laughs> um, and then dive bombers, you know, just, you know, all trying to attack our young trees, you know, among other things. But uh, uh, they wanted to break in and they wanted to get to those young branches and cut them open and deposit their eggs and destroy the fruit of the young branches. And in the same way, you're being attacked constantly. Just keep that image in mind of a yard full of cicadas flying around. You know, and the sound of the cicadas, the buzz, the annoying buzz of the cicadas. Well, that's like our life spiritually. We're being attacked constantly. And he wants to break through our defenses, reach those tender, vulnerable, vulnerable areas of our heart, and plant seeds of destruction. And uh, that'll destroy the fruit of Christ in you. That's what Satan's goal is. Your greatest defense against this is putting on the armor of God, which means how you live in Christ. The more you follow Christ, the uh, less ability the enemy has to infiltrate and distract you. When you compromise God's righteousness in the way you live, it's like taking down the netting, taking down the breastplate, exposing yourself. And you're just opening yourself up to whatever damage the enemy wants to do, whatever the cicadas want to do. Um, putting on God's righteousness is about the consistent practice of living rightly before God and man. Every day we need to decide that are we going to live in the ways of the world? Are we going to give in to the temptations of our flesh? Or are we going to live righteously? Are we going to walk and live in Christ the way he, according to his will. When you get dressed in the morning, you put on clothes. Well, make it your aim also to put on Christ by choosing every morning to walk as Christ would have you walk righteously. This is how you put on the breastplate of righteousness. Satan's goal is to distract this and is distract you from walking righteously. His schemes, the schemes he uses in the Bible that I see, there's probably others, and I may have missed some, but the schemes that I, I see in Scripture are a lies, deception. Scripture says that Satan is the father of lies. He uses temptations. Scripture says that God does not tempt us with evil. Temptation is never from God. Um, he uses accusations. Scripture says that he's the accuser of the brethren. There's probably other things. One accusation that the devil attacks is your identity. You know, accusing you that you weren't, you're not really righteous. You weren't really made righteous. Look at you. Look at you. Just look at you. You weren't made righteous. 
And if you believe that, the schemes of the devil and that lie and that deceit, uh, then he's won because you feel like a failure. You feel like you don't measure up to God and, and, uh, and it's going to affect the way you walk with him and what you do in your Christian life. Satan, the schemes of the devil, he attacks your weaknesses or what he perceives as your possible weaknesses. He's not omniscient. He doesn't know everything like God does. But he'll try to attack your possible weaknesses just like he did trying to attack Jesus himself uh, when he was in the 40 days. If you're tempted to pride, if you're, if you're tempted to be angry, if you're tempted to lust, he, he'll use that. He'll get in there. He'll use that open, that vulnerability, the little hole in the net. He'll find it. And if he can convince you to compromise your faith in any way, to compromise your zeal for Christ in any way, uh, or to, you know, then he's very happy. If he, gives, if he convinces you to give up your walk in faith, boy, he's super happy. Anything to get you off track in your walk with the Lord is what uh, the schemes of the devil are all about. Many Christians and prominent Christian leaders have fallen. We've seen this just even in the last 10, 15 years, so strongly. Many Christian leaders have fallen because they've compromised their righteousness by allowing the devil to have a foothold in their heart and it shipwrecked their, their leadership and their effect in the kingdom of God. Intentionally and purposely living a life of sin leaves you open to attack. Right living makes you impregnable. If you want to quote just keep that to yourself. Right living makes you impregnable. It protects your vital spiritual organs. It protects your heart. Right living protects your heart. In closing, I want to leave you with four R's that maybe you can walk away with and, and remember these as you're walking day to day to help you put on the breastplate of righteousness. Four R's. My four R's of putting on the breastplate of righteousness. You know, notice they're R's. They match righteousness. Anyway, so, yeah. <laughs> my daughter would be dumb, dumb dead. <laughs> the first R, resolve, resolve. Resolve to live a righteous life, which just means to live the way that God would have you live, that would want you to live. You know, there's pl his will is revealed in Scripture. You want to know how to live, just read the Bible. His will is revealed. Resolve to live a righteous life. Resolve. Then rely on the Holy Spirit to live this righteous life. You can't do it on your own, you know. Uh, almost as bad as not trying to live righteously is, uh, you know, trying to live righteously on your own strength, you know. You can't live righteously on your own strength. You need the Holy Spirit. So ask God for help. You've been given His righteousness. Ask Him for help to walk in it. So resolve, rely, repent when you fail. You will fail. This is where humility will come into play. Uh, will you humble yourself before God and before people, apologizing to people for your mistakes? Uh, we all blow it, but uh, it's all about having that humility to repent, confess and repent. And then finally, the last R is realign by getting back up. You know, when you fall and get back up and walk back on his path of righteousness. Listen, I blow it all the time, all the time. You know, I'm not trying to be like a goody two-shoes in my life. I'm just... I just know who I am in Christ, uh, that I've been redeemed, and that I'm a, a child of God, and it doesn't make sense in who I am to live unrighteously. It's just not my identity anymore, and yet my flesh desires to live unrighteously. <laughs> my flesh yearns to live unrighteously, and uh, the world is calling me all around to live unrighteously. Everywhere you look, and I give in far too many times. It's not about being perfect. That's not what we're talking about here. It's about putting on the breastplate of righteousness, continually choosing to repent, put back on the breastplate of righteousness, and keep walking forward again. Don't ever decide to leave your breastplate of righteousness behind. Don't ever give up and leave it behind. Don't leave your heart open to attack. Let's pray. Father, I lift up everyone here today. Lord, I ask that you would uh, strengthen our resolve to walk uh, in your righteousness that you have given us, that we would rely on your spirit to empower us, Lord, that we would uh, submit ourselves to your spirit, be under your spirit's control, Lord. 
Humble us. Humble us. Make us humble that we would rely on your spirit, Lord. Uh, teach us to repent when we fail, Lord, not beat, each other, beat ourselves up, but uh, to repent and to turn away from that, to uh, ask forgiveness. If we've harmed someone, to ask their forgiveness, Lord, to be humble. Make us humble, Lord. Make us humble servants of you. And then uh, help us to realign ourselves, to get back on the path of following you, to put back on the breastplate of righteousness, Lord, when we've been attacked, to put it on and to walk forward, to live rightly, to follow you fully in all that we do. Just like uh, Keith Green resolved to walk in you, Lord, righteously, according to your righteousness, may we as well. Pray this for everyone here. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching our lesson today. We invite you to join us here at Glen Arbor Community Church every Sunday at 10 a.m. Our address is 204 Church Street in West Chicago, Illinois. For more information about our church, please visit us online at www.glenarborchurch.com or email us at info at glenarbor.org.